welcome to Gorilla Doctors Live. Thank you so much for joining us today from wherever you are in the world. In fact, please do participate in the poll that you hopefully can see on your screen so that we can all see where you are zooming in from. It's always really, really fun for us to see how truly global is our Gorilla Doctors community. I'm really looking forward to introducing you to Dr. Ricky Okwir Okello and Dr. Gaspar Denzai Senga, two of our field veterinarians whom you haven't yet had the opportunity to meet in our previous virtual events. Uh, but first, I guess I should briefly introduce myself. My name is Kirsten Gilardi. I am the Executive Director and Chief Veterinary Officer for Gorilla Doctors. I have been a wildlife veterinarian with the UC Davis School of Veterinary Medicine since 1998, where I also serve as the Director of the Karen C. Dreyer Wildlife Health Center. As many of you know, Gorilla Doctors is a unique partnership between the nonprofit, the Mountain Gorilla Veterinary Project, and the Karen C. Dreyer Wildlife Health Center. And that partnership began in 2009. Working as a gorilla doctor has been absolutely one of the highlights of my career and a huge credit for that goes to two people. Uh, first, MGVP's former executive director, Dr. Mike Cranfield, who was a very, very important mentor of mine during veterinary school and who led our organization for more than 20 years until his retirement in 2019. And then second, Dr. Linda Lowenstein, also a very important mentor of mine during veterinary school and who is one of the world's most renowned grade eight pathologists, lucky for us. She's, she's been our serving as our Gorilla Doctors pathologist since Diane Fossey's time. Okay, that's way more than enough about me. It's my really great pleasure today to introduce you to Dr. Gaspard and Dr. Ricky to learn more about them and their work. Uh, before I do, just a reminder that you can send in your questions using the Q&A feature in Zoom anytime during our conversation, and then we will answer as many of your questions as we can at the end. And here they are. Dr. Gaspard is a field veterinarian with the um, with our Rwanda team, and Dr. Ricky is field vet with our Uganda team. Good evening to you both. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Hi, Christine. Do we have those poll results yet? <laughs> oh, we really do have people from all over. So I'll say good evening, good afternoon, or good morning. <laughs> okay, before we get into our conversation, how about each of you tell us what year you started with Gorilla Doctors and how you first heard about our organization? Gaspard, why don't you go first? Yes, thank you. Uh, I was hired as a field veterinarian with the Gorilla Doctors in 2015, uh, but I have been applying for internships since 2011 and started volunteering in 2013. Uh, I first learned of Gorilla Doctors when I was in veterinary school. Uh, I was part of one health student club and Gorilla Doctors came and talked to our club. That's when I learned about one health in the context of Gorilla Medicine and I felt I really need to be part of this team. We are very, very glad you felt the need to join us, Gaspard. Yes, I have been a good doctor now for six years. <laughs> Time flies. Okay, Ricky, how about you? Well, I've been a great doctor since 2014. And like Gaspard, I also volunteered and had internship before there was a job opening. In my third year of university, the professor was teaching us about gorillas and mentioned the gorilla doctors and how they treated wild gorillas. And I became very excited. <laughs> During my free time, I talked to my professor and he gave me Dr. Bernard's phone number. And Dr. Bernard is our head veterinarian in Uganda. And, and some of you may remember him from our GD live event this time last year. Yes, and I had no idea who he was, but I called him and he was so nice to me. He was coming to campus the next week and agreed to meet me. Of course, I had no idea what he looked like. And in my mind, he was this huge guy. <laughs> but he met with me and told me all about Gorilla Doctors and the PREDICT project was just getting started. So I began volunteering with that. Uh, for our audience, the PREDICT project was the U.S. Agency for International Development funded global project to detect emerging pathogens at the interface of wildlife and, wildlife and humans. 
um, Gorilla Doctors led this 10 plus year project in Rwanda and Uganda. We safely and humanely collected samples from thousands of wild primates, bats, and rodents. Our goal was really to discover viruses in wildlife with the potential to spill over into humans and cause disease. So no surprise, that work prepared us very well to help lead outbreak response efforts when COVID-19 first emerged. Um, we began, uh, gorilla doctors began testing ill gorillas for SARS-CoV-2, that's the virus that causes COVID-19, early in 2020. And knock, knock on wood, to date, uh, no wild gorilla we have tested has been positive for COVID-19. Yeah, our preventive measures have so far been effective, uh, wearing masks, increasing our distance from the gorillas, for example. Uh, still, I have to say, it has been hard to begin each day without worrying, uh, but knowing we are in, all in this together gives me hope and we keep going. Yeah, I can, can most definitely imagine that each time a gorilla is showing clinical signs of illness, it's unnerving. I know it is for me every time you all let me know that we may have a respiratory disease outbreak on our hands. Yes, and of, of course, respiratory illness in Korea is common. In most cases, they get better without requiring treatment, but there are times when supportive treatment is really necessary. When a Korea is sick, uh, we always collect samples to test for multiple pathogens. Ricky, correct me if I'm wrong, but we haven't had to treat any respiratory illness in Uganda this year. Is that right? That's correct. So far in 2021, we have not treated any mountain gorillas for respiratory illness. Yeah, thank goodness. Although the ever-present risk definitely keeps me up at night, I'm not going to lie. Um, I know it's been a worry for many of you who are here with us today, and you've all been so loyal in your donations these last two years, despite all of our own challenges with pandemic life. I, we're just incredibly grateful to you all, and I know that the health and well-being of the gorillas is why you support Gorilla Doctors. Um, and on that note, in fact, I would like for Gaspard to share with you all a very special story um, about a snare rescue that he and our Rwanda team did in 2020. Um, I'm, I'm sure, Gaspard, it feels like that happened yesterday. <laughs> yes, yes, thank you. Uh, it was in July 2020, and we received the call from the park rangers in midday that an infant was caught in snare. The infant Ines uh, is in Igisha group, by then the second largest gorilla group in Volcanoes National Park with multiple silverbacks. Uh, the rangers reported that the group had been trying to flee Ineza from the snare, but couldn't and made it worse by making the snare even tighter instead. And so had moved away. Uh, we then rushed up to the area. It was about uh, one, one and a half hour drive and then two hour hike. So we arrived at, at the area at around 4 p.m. Uh, the group was about 400 meters away from Ineza. And as you can imagine, the infant was very distressed. Uh, we immediately mobilized the infant, removed the snare, treated his wounds. Uh, the hardest part was reuniting Ineza with the group since it had moved away. We had to carry him and chase after the group who kept moving faster and faster to avoid what they thought was the danger. Now, the silverbacks kept charging and it was getting dark but we finally were able to release the infant in sight of the lead silverback and the mother. Uh, the silverback quickly grabbed the infant and immediately took it over to his mother. Uh, we then had to rush down uh, the mountain. It was stressful, but a good day. Uh, we did several follow-up monitoring visits and he was recovering and healing. Gaspard, what's it? To feel like when you do a checkup on a gorilla that you treated to to know that you helped save its life it's amazing <laughs> it's amazing uh it's wonderful to see the individuals recovering from trauma or disease uh, i recently did a health check of a geisha group and i'm happy to report that the infant is healthy and thriving you know those days are exhausting, but when you go back and see the individual recovering, it's so motivating. 
Yeah, Gaspar, I, I think we can all imagine how incredible that must be. Thank you for sharing that story. Ricky, of course, uh, you have a pretty remarkable snare rescue story to share too. Yes, but to start it on a positive note, this is a rescue from 2019 because we have not had a gorilla caught in a snare in Uganda since this one in 2019. That is a good thing. It is also important to note that this is an extreme example of what can happen in the field. Uh, agreed that the story is extreme, but it's it's our reality, isn't it? When our patients are wild and the forest is our hospital, right? That's true. And as you will hear, we are also surrounded by other wild animals like buffaloes and elephants. On the evening of August 17, 2019, I received a call from a park warden that an infant was caught in a snare in Mugahinga Gorilla National Park. I was in Bohoma at Buendi Impenetrable National Park headquarters. So that evening, I drove about four hours to Kisoro. The next morning, we drove about 30 minutes to the park and hiked for about one hour until we arrived at the infant. The infant, we call it Tulambule, is in Yakagezi group, which has three silverbacks, all of whom were very agitated. So it took us another hour to visually assess the condition of the infant. Once we confirmed that the infant indeed was in a snare wrapped around the wrist, our plan was to immobilize both the infant and the mother. We darted the infant first and the dominant silverback known as Mark rushed over, grabbed the infant and ran off. We followed after the group for one hour and when we saw the silverback again, he no longer had to lambule. We realized at some point he had dropped him. We immediately split up into five different groups to cycle back and find the infant. Remember, we had anesthetized him, so he was asleep and not making any sound. During this time, one of the search groups started shouting and yelling, and we all rushed to find them. One of the rangers had been attacked by a wild buffalo. This ranger was a former poacher, so he knew how to survive the buffalo attack. I'm sure if it had been me, I would have not survived. Once we got him rescued and some of the side party took him out of the forest to get medical attention, we resume our search for the infant. Ricky, that must have been so incredibly stressful. Um, for our audience, that, that photo is not from that day. It's just to show you what our teams often face when they're working in the forest. Um, Ricky, is the ranger okay? Did he make a full recovery? Yes, he's okay and made a full recovery. He began work after two weeks of treatment. Uh, after the buffalo incident and rescue, we resumed our work, our search for Tulambule, and we found him when he woke up and started vocalizing. We immediately immobilized him again, removed the snare, and treated his wounds the next challenge became reuniting him with his family group, which was quite difficult because, because the group had moved almost 10 kilometers away. That's impressive because 10 kilometers is about six miles. And remember, this is 10 kilometers through super dense and steep rainforest. That's correct. It took eight rangers to carry the infant who was almost three years old and weighed about 19 kilograms or 40 pounds. And we had to keep the infant immobilized the entire time. After about six hours, we found the group, but they were still very agitated and the silverback kept charging us. We were finally able to get about 20 meters away from the silverback and leave Tulambule on the ground. He started making noises and the silverback charged at us sending everyone running in all directions. <laughs> the silverback picked up Tulambule and took him back to the group. The next morning, he was observed with his mother and he was fine. 
Ricky, another incredible story. And I actually remember that I arrived in the region not long after this intervention and you and I were driving to our field station in Kasoro and you were still kind of shaking your head in amazement that it had happened. Um, how long did that take from start to finish? Well, we arrived at the infant at 10 in the morning and you, we reunited it with the family at 8.30 that evening. By the time we got back to our truck and to the field station, it was 10 p.m. So it was a full 12 hour day. I learned from that experience to always take my flashlight with me in the forest because I did not have it with me when it was dark in the forest. Live and learn, huh? Wow, what a day. When was the last time you checked on Tulumbule? Uh, I conducted a health check back in October and he was doing great. He's nearly six years old now and there is a special bond and it will always increase as I watch him grow up from a 40 pound infant into a 400 pound silver bag. And now he has a sibling and he's always carrying the infant around his back. Thank you both for sharing those stories of rescuing gorillas from snares. It, they both, both of those stories really brought the critical importance of our work to life. Um, you all know with around, uh, only around 1,063 mountain gorillas left on the planet, the survival of each one is essential to the sustainability and growth of the population. Um, while both of your stories were about snares and they are definitely a significant and constant threat, I'm, I'm really happy to report that so far in 2021, we have had only one snare incident this past July in Kahuzi Biega National Park in Eastern DR Congo, where a young Grower's gorilla was caught in a snare. And again, Gorilla Doctors was able to remove that snare and that gorilla is doing great. So let's keep our fingers crossed that we get through December without any more snare incidents. Okay, so now uh, we know you are fearless in the forest and you're totally dedicated to your gorilla doctor's work. I would love to pivot to some more personal stories so our audience here can learn a little bit more about each of you. Um, Gaspard, let's go back to you. I think everyone would love to hear about your other passion projects outside of gorilla doctors. Yeah, thank you. Uh, this project is not entirely outside of Gorilla Doctors, uh, only because it began as a result of my joining Gorilla Doctors. As I mentioned at the beginning, uh, I first did an internship with the Gorilla Doctors before being hired. Each day when I arrived at the, at the office, there was this young girl standing along the street outside our office, and she would still be there each evening when I left. I wondered why she wasn't in school. And eventually I learned that it was because her parents couldn't afford it. That made me sad. And I started wondering if there was something I could do. Luckily, I was hired by Gorilla Doctors, immediately uh, started supporting her school fees, as well as several others in the neighborhood. It made me think I could start something in the community. You know, in Uganda, most of the high quality education has become unaffordable. So I rented a small place, found some qualified volunteers and started a small school. Uh, I was literally using my Gorilla Doctor's salary to support this adventure of mine. <laughs> when we started uh, growing slowly and getting so many requests, then we started getting some families that could afford at least half, half of the fees as we set the price that most families could afford. For those that couldn't afford even our fees, we aimed to look for sponsors. In 2016, we started with uh, six, 14 kids. Um, and today we, uh, we have nearly 100 students. Uh, we had to close during the COVID in 2020, but we used that time to buy a plot of land and build our own center so that over the long term, we could be more financially stable and sustainable. We opened again in October, 2021 in our new permanent home. We are growing little by little every day. Gaspar, does the school have a name? Oh, yes. 
Uh, it's called uh, Archangel Nursery School. Archangel, I love that. I never realized you were using your entire salary from Gorilla Doctors when you first started. That's just incredible and selfless. Um, so what is your dream for these children? Are you hoping that they all become Gorilla Doctors in the future? Well, I like to say I, I cannot dream for them. I can only inspire them to dream big. Uh, I want the kids to understand that uh, they have power to become anything they aspire to be in life. Uh, and yes, kids look up to me as a role model and some of them would obviously want to become a wildlife veterinarian just like me. <laughs> we can't see, we can't wait to see what happens to each of them. So not only, Ricky, are you helping save gorillas for future generations, but you're helping teach and motivate this human generation. Well, uh, just in case all of you aren't feeling inspired enough, let's hear about Dr. Ricky's journey to becoming a wildlife veterinarian. Ricky, please tell us your story. Ricky, as you know, I come from a very rural community in Northern Uganda. My first dream was to be a photographer. <laughs> there was only one photographer in our entire region and it would come through once a year at Christmas. <laughs> if you miss having the photo on Christmas, you would have to wait a full year. So I thought it would be a very good thing to be the only person in my village uh, to be a photographer. But uh, when I was six years old, my life changed. We had a, a family dog named Liberation. We named him that because he was born the same year dictator Idi Amin was kicked out of office as the president of Uganda. I love this dog so much. It would greet me when I come home from school and I could always tell that it was happy to see me. Then one day I came home from school and the dog was gone. He had gotten old and sick and my, my family got rid of him in a rudimentary and inhumane way. I was so hungry and sad. I thought probably if I become a veterinarian, I can teach people how to take care of their dogs when they become old. So that is how I first wanted to become a veterinarian. Uh, but when I was uh, eight years old, I rescued a squirrel that had been wounded by a spear. There was a lot of poaching and hunting for game meat where I grew up. My mother is a retired nurse, so I grew up seeing how she treated wounds on people, and I thought I could use the same knowledge to treat the squirrel. I cleaned the wound, gave it penicillin, and after about a week of caring for it, it recovered and went back into the bush. I had no idea before this that wildlife could be treated. There was no TV in my community, so it was very shocking to discover that wildlife could be treated and return to the wildlife. I was, that is when I decided to become a wildlife veterinarian. <laughs> Tell us again how old you were. Uh, I, I was about eight years old. <laughs> okay, Ricky, that's young. Okay, please go on. It wasn't until I reached university that I learned about other wildlife veterinarians in Uganda. In my third year, a professor was teaching us about gorillas and the veterinarians who treated them, and that is how I first learned about gorilla doctors. I said to myself, oh, this is what I've been dreaming about. <laughs> I met Dr. Bernard, started volunteering and doing internships, and was finally hired. Ricky, to realize at eight years old that you wanted to be a veterinarian for wildlife without even knowing that that existed as a career is just so great. And that you held on to that goal all the way through school. Um, so now that you've achieved that dream, do you have others? Uh, you know, when I saw Windy for the first time, I had never seen a forest like that. The entire forest is full of trees. When I grow up, where I grow up, it's very dry and there are no trees. When I retire, I want to create a small forest plantation back in my village. 
I want to plant as many trees as possible so that in 20 to 30 years when I finish my work, I will have enough trees to remind me of where I met my dreams. So Ricky, you're going to literally plant trees and watch them grow into a beautiful forest. Gaspard, you're planting the seeds of education for young children and watching them grow. I think I can speak for everyone listening that we are just so impressed by you both. And I am sure our audience is overflowing with questions. Um, quickly, before we transition to our Q&A session, um, I want to thank all of you for joining us today. I also want to give a very special thanks to those of you who support us with your donations, your contributions, our directly support, Dr. Gaspard and Dr. Ricky and our entire team to save a species one gorilla at a time. If you haven't yet made a gift this year, we would be very grateful if you would consider Gorilla Doctors in your year-end giving plans. Your gift, your gift may even be eligible for a company match in our donation program. Our donation page makes it possible for you to check that. We have placed the link in the chat where you can make a one-time donation or become a Gorilla Guardian by committing to give automatically and regularly. We'll place another link for info about the Gorilla Guardian program in the chat. So again, thank you all so much for being with us virtually today and learning more about our work. Uh, let's start answering your questions. And I have been monitoring the chat box and they are coming in fast and furious. So uh, let me go, let's start here. Okay, guys, are you ready? Ricky, several people have asked, how do you test a gorilla for COVID? Yeah, so uh, basically we, uh... We normally, uh, when a gorilla is reported for uh, with coughing, with any cough, uh, we collect samples non-invasively, and uh, we normally get samples from the feces. Uh, we store them in the right media, and then we have one of the best labs, I could say, in, in Uganda, at uh, Uganda Virus Research Institute, where uh, they are tested within 24 hours and we are sure whether it is uh, positive or negative. And it is also important to note that for the, uh, from the, uh, the first outbreak of COVID in humans, we have not had any uh, gorillas in the wild uh, with uh, uh, which that tested positive for COVID. Thank Thanks you. Ricky. Here's another question for you, Ricky, from Zachary. Um, do you help often help with other species as well as gorillas. Um, and how does the team learn if a gorilla has been caught in a snare? Uh, so uh, basically, uh, we live in a place where there are hundreds of other wildlife. And uh, as gorilla doctors, in particular, Windy Impenetrable National Park, we are the only veterinarians who are available and at times we are called a diker is caught in a, a snare or is having any problem so we can run in there and then rescue uh, a number of times the pangolins can be um, in the community maybe someone was trying to poach it we come in and then try to uh, intervene and treat it and take it back to the wild so quite often we treat also other wildlife uh, which are within our area of work and then the second part of that question, Ricky, how to um, maybe tell our audience how, how we find out that there's a gorilla in the park that's been caught in a snare. So uh, basically what we, we have what we call um, routine health checks where every, every time we go and check the gorillas and see how they are doing and uh, if it is having any condition. And then uh, at times we are not in that particular group but rangers keep on monitoring all the habituated gorilla groups every day. So once a gorilla is found in a wire snare or having any condition, not only the wire snares, it is immediately reported to us. And within a very short period of time, we are already available there to intervene and remove the snares. Thanks. Um, is this a question for you, Gaspard? from Kate. Uh, she asks, what do you think is the most important thing for people to know about gorillas? 
Or maybe another way of posing that question is, are there some common misconceptions about, about gorillas? Uh, well, thank you. I, I think the most important thing to know about gorillas um, is to know they have uh, character. Uh, they, uh, they, are, they, they have personality, they are gentle, they are I mean, the common misconception has always been historically that they're beasts, they're uh, dangerous, they can be dangerous to humans, which is totally the opposite. They are very gentle giants. They, uh, they're very, I don't know, uh, they, they are very gentle, they are very uh, peaceful. Um, yeah. That, that one of my uh, things that uh, Mike Cranfield used to always say is they're big, gentle vegetarians living in the middle of a salad bowl. Exactly. <laughs> um, all right, um, Gaspard, I'll stick with you with this next question uh, from MH. First of all, thanking you both for your incredible work. Um, what's, what's the favorite part? What is the favorite part of your work? at Gorilla Doctors. Of all the things that you do, Gaspard, what's what's the, your favorite aspect of your work? Yeah, my favorite part has always been uh, to be able to see the impact, the direct impact of our work. Uh, if, if we were able to intervene and, and save the animal from, 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 from the life-threatening condition and see it him or her being able to recover from the disease or uh, trauma, it's always my favorite uh, part of the work, seeing the individual recovering and feeling that pride really you've done, you've done it. You've helped save a species really. I can imagine. Uh, Ricky, do you have anything you'd like to add to that? Is that the favorite part of your work or do you have another one also? You got your mute on, Ricky. You're... Well, uh, pretty much similar to that, but I would say what makes me happiest is when you come into the forest, you look at an infant, how they are playing with each other, with the mother, with the silverback, and to see that infant growing from that probably two kilograms into a 150 kilogram when you are still there. I would say one thing that has made me very happy here, when I first came as a student, the first intervention that I participated was, it was a, on a snare, an infant had a snare, a very young infant, but I'm proud to say that just 10 years ago, now I see that infant that where we removed the wire snare from, which could have died, is already a mature adult female and is having a baby. So it makes me happy to see such an individual growing over time when I'm seeing it. It really makes me happy. That's great. Um, Ricky, this is a question from Lewis. Uh, over time, do the interventions get easier as the groups get to know their gorilla doctors, rangers, and doctors? I mean, are the gorillas afraid of you as the veterinarian, or does it? Do they get used to you being there to help them? I, I would explain that the whole day because it is very variable. <laughs> yeah. A number of times, depending on the conditions, there are times when their gorillas are different in their own ways. There are particular groups where you find a gorilla, you will go and treat a gorilla in 30 minutes. There is a gorilla group, I can give you an example called Habinyanja group. When you are going to that group, it will take you quite a lot of time because it is having one of the most protective silverbacks, is always aware of what is happening, wants to protect all the individuals. So 
If you are going to that group, no, it's going to take you a very long time. There are some Gorilla groups. I can give you an example. Here we have Roche Gorilla group. It is one of the best group for treatment. The syllabus is calm. When you go to treat the individuals, probably an individual is having a wire snare. I would think, not documented, but I would think some gorillas know when there is a wire snare and you go in there, you are going to hold because they have been struggling the whole day. They have failed to remove the snare. And then when you arrive there, they see the dart gun, they know there is help coming. But there are some other gorilla groups where whenever they see the dart gun, they know there is war. An example of what I told you about uh, the one in Mukahinga, where the moment they see a dart gun, there is war. So mm -hmm. it is very variable. I can tell you that the whole day. Yeah. Um, I know you all, several of you on, on the teams, Uganda, Rwanda, and Congo, have said that that with time, actually, the adults in a group sometimes spot the snares. They can see the snares in the forest, and they'll actually stand be between the snare and their family and sort of usher their family past so that the babies don't get curious and in, in their playfulness and get caught. Is that have you seen that? I have seen that several times. Yeah, that's amazing. Uh, you know, when we go to the forest, normally at times you meet wire snares in the forest and, and you find a gorilla was moving towards that direction. It realizes there is a, a snare in there and you see it has diverted and moved in a different direction. Uh -huh. So I think gorillas have over time realized what the snares are and at times they can easily divert from the snares. Yeah. Um, I'm going to go to a question for me, actually, from Rebecca, who's asking about if we have difficulty evaluating and treating Grower's gorillas, given the conflict in the DRC. Um, as as we alluded to earlier, when we talked about the Grower's gorilla that got caught in the snare in July, um, there are uh, three groups of human habituated Grower's gorillas that live in Cahuza Viega. And because they're human habituated, we can very closely monitor them and take care of them um, if they get injured or ill. Um, just this year, we've hired an, our newest veterinarian, um, Dr. Lena Nturubika. Uh, we hired her to be specifically assigned to Cahuza Viega National Park in Congo to be taking care, to be there at the park if a Grower's gorilla um, needs our help. And so, um, so we are able to provide life-saving veterinary care to those animals. And then, but the reality is that most Grower's gorillas are not human habituated. And so we, nobody gets close enough to them to see if they're ill or injured. So we have been working on developing and deploying techniques for monitoring the health of the population of Grower's gorillas. And that's, that's a big focus for us going forward. Um, it's a good lead into this topic of discussion to a question posed to you both, let me find it. So either one of you, um, feel free to answer or both, but this comes from Sandy in Luxembourg. She says, what do you think will be the situation for wild gorillas in about 30 years, considering all the challenging times, um, especially um, with uh, the unrest in Eastern Congo and of course the pandemic, um, do, do they really have a chance of thriving? Gaspar, do you want to take that one first? You're on mute. We can't hear you because you're on mute. Yeah, sorry. Okay. If I got it right, uh, what we think of the situation of white gorillas in the next 30 years. Yes. Uh, given the situation of uh, civil unrest or security issues, um, I would like to be optimistic and uh, say uh, gorillas will thrive uh, as long as um, individual uh, governments and and uh, different organization conservation organizations in in the area really take this up to them to 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 enforce it uh, we are working as hard as we can and uh, several there are several people several organizations working at that as hard as we they can to for the 
sustainability of uh, the mountain gorillas and and it's working it has worked uh, years back and it's working i'm really hoping that uh, uh, they and we are also educating uh, young generations uh, to inspiring them to really understand the importance of gorilla conservation. So I'm really very uh, optimistic and I'm hopeful that they will be still there and thriving. I mean, there are several initiatives with the governments, and in, including the park expansions or, and several other initiatives. So uh, they will thrive. Yeah, I mean, there's thank you for that, Gaspar. And they're certainly on the right trajectory, right? I mean, mountain gorillas are one of the world's few conservation success stories. I mean, they went from just a few hundred to over a thousand now. The population just keeps increasing. Um, that increase has been attributed to what Gaspard is talking about, this extreme conservation, the fact that all mountain gorillas live in protected areas and, and the majority of them are human habituated so they can be monitored. Um, and if they need veterinary care, they get it. Um, the veterinary care has been um, determined statistically to be a really significant factor in the recovery of the species. So, um, you know, it's, it's, I mean, it's definitely motivating for me to be part of a wildlife conservation success story. And there aren't enough of them in the world, but this is definitely one of them. And, um, you know, it was a cause for celebration really when the IUCN, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, change the mountain gorilla's conservation status from critically endangered to endangered. That that was a win. They're still endangered, but it was a win and things are going in the right direction. Now you can't necessarily say the same thing about their close cousins, the grower gorillas, because the grower gorillas live in a part of the part of the world that still sees a lot of unrest, civil unrest and war, and a lot of grower gorillas live outside of areas that are well protected. So there's they remain critically endangered. So our work there's is really, really important. Um, we have a question and a question for me from Kate um, that I'm happy to answer. And guys, if you have anything you'd like to add, please do. Um, what kind of safety measures do gorilla doctors take to ensure that we don't spread disease to the gorillas? It's a great question. Um, you know, there are some very basic preventive measures that we have always taken uh, when our our team is in the field, and that is that we wear gloves and masks. The things that we all do have been doing since March 2020 here on in the world um, is our sort of best practices for disease prevention that we've been um, doing our entire time of our existence as gorilla doctors. And in fact, the pandemic is um, really we've we've been advocating for a long time for people who get within a close distance of the gorillas to wear masks, just because that is just a, such a simple thing that we can do to prevent the possible transmission of disease to gorillas. And of course, with the pandemic and all of us humans wearing masks when we're in close proximity to people to 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 really limit the spread of um, COVID nineteen, those same practices now are are in happening in the parks at all times people anywhere anyone who comes into close proximity of gorillas is wearing a mask so that's that's a huge huge step to protecting the gorillas from disease just as it's been critically important in our um, human populations to limit the spread of COVID-19. Um, of course Gaspard would be the first to say that if, if he wakes up and he's not feeling well he doesn't go to work. <laughs> we we yeah. recognize that um, that human viruses can get into gorilla populations, and so it's really important that if somebody's not well, that they don't go into the forest. Um, so anyway, that's. Uh, did you have anything you wanted to add to that, Gaspard? And it looks. Did we lose? Might have we lost Ricky? It looks like maybe we lost Ricky. Probably his power went out in Bahama. But anything yeah. you'd like to I add to that? Yeah, I think in addition to that. Um, we also do regular testing, especially in regard to the current pandemic we are dealing with. We do have regular testing in case one might contact it. So also one of the preventive measures. Yeah, good point. And, um, you know, fortunately, all of our staff um, in all three countries has been vaccinated, um, which they were governments and parks appropriately realized that it was very, very important for the people who go into the parks every day to monitor 
the gorilla populations to be vaccinated for the virus. So, um, and by sort of by the same token, when um, the pandemic started and there were some very strict lockdown measures in place in all three countries, um, fortunately for us, um, the government really did understand that um, that uh, gorilla doctors was providing essential services, and so we were still allowed to come and go to the park to do our work as needed. Um, and um, again, knock wood, the, the gorillas that we've obtained samples from and tested for COVID-19, none of those tests have been positive. So, um, okay, I'm back to, I'm scrolling through questions here. Hi, Ricky, glad to have you back, perhaps. Hello, I'm <laughs> right in Windy, the Nitrabu National Park and uh, <laughs> everything. Power comes, power possible. goes, internet comes, internet goes, we understand, no problem. Um, okay, <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, oh, this is a great question. Um, it's uh, for me, but I, I'm, please join me if you'd like to answer um, Gaspard and Ricky, but as, a, as field veterinarians for the gorillas, what do we need the most in order to continue our work? Um, medicine, equipment, more staff, policy changes, other, you know, um, as I stated earlier in this call, the support of our donors is, absolutely critical to our operations. We get all of our work done um, from funds that are, are donated um, by donors and those funds go to all kinds of things. They go to our, our team and their salaries. They go to purchasing essential supplies for the field, um, better medic medications, veterinary medications, anesthetics, um, you know, the transportation we need to get to and from the park. So those core general operations are absolutely critical to our mission and, and donor support um, is absolutely makes that possible. Um, let's see here. Um, let's see, There's this is a question for any of us. Um, first of all, thank you for all the work that you do and we cherish our memories of visiting the gorillas and their doctors. Um, that was, a, this is from Amy, by the way, not Amy Bond, but an Amy. Um, can you tell us whether, um, like, what is the situation in the communities around the parks? Is there, what are the risks? Um, are there civil unrest still an issue that threatens the gorillas? Um, tell us about kind of the feeling in the communities around the parks and how they feel about the parks and the gorillas. Ricky, do you want to take that one? <laughs> you go back and forth between Bahoma and Kisoro, and you, it's, those communities are so closely tied to the parks. Yeah, well, I would say um, for the past many years now, in Uganda side, Gaspard is going to talk about Rwanda and probably Virungas. Uh, the community benefit of the park has been, I would say it has been massive, it has increased communities have been benefiting from the park, from the revenue sharing, from the jobs that they get from the park. And uh, they have now valued the relevance of, uh, of, uh, of gorillas to them. And they know how important gorillas are. So that is one of the reasons why in the past few years, the number of snares have reduced uh, drastically. And as you had, uh, the whole of this year on Uganda side, we have not had any gorilla caught in a wire snare, and we pray that by the end of this year, we should not have any gorilla caught up in a wire snare. But unfortunately, last year, um, it was a very sad story uh, where one of a silverback, actually I would say my favorite silverback, called Rafiki, you might have seen them on the media, it was killed by a poacher. This is something that was very unique. And uh, during that, uh, COVID had just come in. Some community people had lost their jobs. They were no longer selling their food produce and uh, crafts to the tourists, no tourism at all. So actually the number of wire snares in the forest started increasing and the number of people started going into the forest to look for basically food. Not that they are going to set wire snares to trap gorillas, no, but to look for die cuts and to survive. And unfortunately, one of the gorillas 
was a victim, was speared by a, 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 a poacher. Accidentally, a, a gorilla came and thought probably wanted to attack him and then he speared it and it died. And that was my favorite gorilla. And I feel very sad to do a post-mortem on your most favorite gorilla. I still feel like it just happened yesterday. So, it was your very careful post-mortem examination that determined that Rafiki had been killed by a spear. I mean, it, had you not, I, I can't imagine how difficult that procedure was for you, but then you had the your wits about you and to be able to see that and confirm that, you know, if if you had not been there to do that exam, we wouldn't have known that about that. That's how R Rafiki died. So um, anyway, um, Rafiki was a big, strong silverback. We have a question from Lynn. Uh, she says, thank you from Canada. This is a question for either one of you. Um, how do gorillas get to be so strong from just eating vegetables? <laughs> Plant power. <laughs> Gaspard can start. <laughs> I think I would ask the same question. <laughs> yeah. Well, for, you know, fortunately, do the gorillas have the right bacteria in their in their guts and their gastrointestinal tract to just extract all the nutrition from the plants that they eat including proteins from the plants that they eat and they're they've adapted they've evolved right to to just be able exactly, to exactly exactly and and they they, they spend <laughs> enormous amount of time eating and they eat a whole bunch of food uh, i mean yeah so many kilograms so I think that would make sense. Uh, yeah, they're eating. They're they're eating. eating. Yeah. Yeah, eating, I, eating. I, yeah, I think gorillas spend a lot of time. For us as humans, we do so many things, but gorillas have very specific programs. In the morning, they wake up, they start moving, eating and eating and resting. And so basically, gorillas eat a lot of food. <laughs> and by the way, they are very selective. Don't think gorillas eat all the vegetations that they come across. They are very selective. You might find a plant somewhere in the forest and it's looking very wonderful and amazing and glittering and you think a gorilla is going to pick it, but it will not pick it, but it will go and pick a particular plant. And so gorillas eat a lot of food. We estimate that a silverback can feed up to about 25 kilograms of food in a day. That is massive and it's good. And Normally when we are doing a post-mortem and we try to collect the food from the stomach and you try to weigh, yeah, it's right that gorillas feed that massive amount of food. You find the, fico the food content is about 25 kilograms or plus, so gorillas do eat well, unlike us probably, <laughs> that eat a lot of things which are junks and so yeah. vegetarians are good. <laughs> I always feel we have so much we can learn from from gorillas. They're living the good life, right? So, well, on that note, um, I'm afraid we're out of time, everyone. Um, Dr. Ricky, Dr. Gaspard, thank you so much for taking the time out of your evenings to be with us today. Um, it's just been very, very heartwarming to spend the hour with you um, when we're all coming in from all over the planet. So thank you for sharing your stories and for your dedication to both gorilla doctors and to the world around you. Um, I know I feel like one of the luckiest people in the world to get to work with you both. Thanks everyone for joining us. We'll be sending out a link to the recording of this event within the next few days if you wanna share it with anyone. Take care, happy holidays, have a very peaceful and healthy new year. Thank you very much for your support and for being here today. Bye. 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 <laughs>